Hello and welcome to the Rogers Brief. I'm Adam Rogers. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening. Today was day 44 of the Mass Casualty Commission proceedings and the day featured uh, an expert, well, panel. They were sworn in as witnesses or affirmed as witnesses. Then there was, uh, secondly, a uh, foundational document presentation by Commission Council and then finally this afternoon an expert presentation by Dr. Deborah Doherty uh, who is an expert on um, intimate partner gender-based violence in a rural Atlantic Canadian context. Has done some research on the subject. So this uh, is the beginning of a week where the entire focus of the Mass Casualty Commission's attention is going to be on intimate partner violence, gender-based violence, and it is going to, or is anticipated that it will culminate on Friday with a uh, testimony, or probably better to say a, a series of statements, a question and answer interview with Lisa Banfield, the common law spouse of Gabriel Wartman, common law spouse for 19 years of uh, Gabriel Wartman. Uh, there's all kinds of issues, of course, you may be aware of with that. Uh, she's not going to be cross examined. Uh, she's uh, going to be asked questions only by. Uh, Inquiry Commission Council. Other participants have been invited to submit questions for that cross-examination. Uh, the main uh, lawyers for the families are uh, boycotting that process. They're not going to uh, submit questions, rely on Commission Council, which according to the commissioners should be sufficient since they are there to represent the public interest, dig in and get answers as uh, need be. So. I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened today, but first I've gone through the statements from Miss Banfield, and I want to talk about that for a little bit first because there's a, a really important thing that I don't see that anybody else has noticed. I haven't noticed it any in the, any of the other coverage, and it's something that you may only see if you're a lawyer reviewing these statements in in that kind of a context. So I'm going to start there and. I guess what I'll really start with is this the comment from uh, Commissioner uh, Commission Counsel Emily Hill last week in the media that Miss Banfield, uh, you know, they're trying to defend the fact that she's not going to be cross-examined, only be questioned by Commission Counsel, and then she says, well, she's submitted to five lengthy interviews with uh, Commission uh, staff, lawyers, investigators, or others, uh, and so that's. Uh, that's enough. She's participated. She's provided information voluntarily, they say, and so that's somehow good enough. Well, I want to see uh, what this turns into over the next few days, because here's a suspicion I have. Because when you look at the Mass Casualty Commission documents and just type in Banfield, you'll see different statements and, and some documents. The documents appear to be emails sent between uh, Miss Banfield and uh, Gabriel Wartman and uh, back and forth talking about the cleaning the police car that sort of thing so that's some voluntary disclosure on her part i guess but when you listen to the statement from miss hill it sounds like she uh, that is miss banfield has participated in these interviews recently in fact she did four of the five interviews we don't know what's in the fifth one yet it hasn't been posted uh, in in the immediate aftermath of the shootings so the morning of April 19th, she gave a statement to Constable Terry Brown, of course was involved in the Onslow Belmont shooting incidents, uh, incident, and April 20th, Ms. Banfield gave a statement to uh, Staff Sergeant Greg Vardy. On April 21st, she gave a further statement uh, to Staff Sergeant Vardy, which is summarized, uh, his notes are 19 pages of summarized notes. And then on April 28th, 2020, so still within 10 days, a uh, week of the incident, 10 days of the incident, uh, gave a her, what was at the time, her final statement, 124 pages long, uh, again, to Staff Sergeant Vardy. So I read through these and uh, I was trying to see, I, I was coming up with questions that I think Ms. Spanfield should be asked if Commission Council is doing their job on Friday. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a post later on this week. But there was a, an issue that came up. There was actually, well, there's two issues. One is, if you were to take 
somebody, I think, if you were to take an unknowing reader, in other words, somebody that doesn't know about the mass casualty uh, in Nova Scotia, hadn't heard of it, hadn't read the news, and just said, okay, read these four statements. These, you know, question and answer uh, statements with Miss Banfield and the RCMP officers, and then tell me what the crime is that the perpetrator uh, has committed. I think uh, an unknowing reader might say, well, uh, unlawful confinement of Miss Banfield. He kept her in the uh, in the police vehicle, in the replica vehicle, against her will, forced her into there, uh, from which she had to escape. And we could talk about that uh, at some point as well. I'm sure she'll be asked about that. And then arson. There were some fires. Uh, places were burning down. There was uh, you know fires lit around Portapic, and she talked a, bit, a little bit about that and seeing that in. Reading the statements, there was no sense, I didn't get the sense anyway from listening, reading her answers that she had a real sense of or felt the magnitude of what had happened over those uh, 13 hours. I mean, she was giving long answers about other people in Portapique that she didn't know well, didn't trust, didn't like, uh, but... It didn't seem to have sunk in, at least, uh, you know, over the course of those statements that uh, that there was 22 people killed uh, at the hands of her common-law spouse. So uh, that's that's something. I, I really uh, invite other readers to go through that and just see if you had the same sense. It really didn't seem to me like, you know, she wasn't struggling to answer and thinking of all oh, those poor kids or those poor people or those poor anything. She was just answering the questions as they were asked in long answers, uh, wasn't taking breaks. Uh, said she felt fine, I had her sister with her uh, for most of those interviews. Didn't seem to be struggling to answer questions. So we'll see how that materializes over time. But the other thing, uh, that's that's sort of a, uh, you know, a factual uh, question that she'll have to answer, uh, or a tone answer perhaps. But the other one is a legal issue, which is, when you have, uh, I've listened to, you know, hundreds of uh, statements given by accused people to the police. And the first thing the police do when they feel somebody is, they suspect somebody has committed a crime, they give them a charter warning. You have the right not to answer questions. You have the right to counsel. Uh, nothing you can say is, uh, you know, anything you say is going to be used against you or can be used against you. Uh, I'm not going to threaten you, and you, you have no hope of any, uh, you know, gaining anything by answering all those things. Those charter warnings are given. By the end of it, it takes a long time. It's something that's done typically very deliberately, verbatim, reading off a card. Uh, and this is a big issue because if people aren't given their charter rights before they answer questions of the police, charges can be withdrawn, it, evidence can be thrown out, all those things. So... When some, and it's a key moment in many cases, okay, well, when did you start to suspect that the person was in possession of whatever, right? Here, Miss Banfield, okay, so the police have been talking over the last few weeks as they were explaining certain things they were doing, and, you know, Darren, Cam Darren Campbell's notes, well, there was this ongoing investigation. Okay, what was the ongoing investigation? Was it perhaps to see who was helping, if anybody was helping a workman acquire his weapons, carry out his plans, any of those things. Well, one of the first people you might suspect would be Miss Banfield. Until proven otherwise, until evidence shows otherwise. So, one might have expected early on in those statements, maybe not in the first one with Constable Brown, it's an emergency, the, the situation was still unfolding, we need to get the answers, tell us everything you know so we can get out and stop this guy. Okay, but the next day, the day after, a week later, would have expected, if she was a suspect, that there would have been these charter warnings given at the beginning of the interviews, given right to counsel, all of that. But it wasn't until the final of those four statements, the one on April 28th, uh, 124 pages long on page 96 through 98, as they're discussing cross-border activity, going down to Maine, knew a guy there, Sean Conlaw, that arraigned, you know, that was sort of Wartman's, uh, uh, you know, he'd send guns to Sean Conlaw, he'd go down and pick them up, take them across the border, and would hide them in his truck in these compartments or whatever. So they were getting to Miss Banfield's knowledge or understanding of his system of going down to the States and acquiring these firearms, 
And all of a sudden, it must have occurred to Staff Sergeant Vardy, well, gee, maybe she knows more about this than uh, originally thought or expected. And he starts giving her a paraphrased version of the charter warning. He was, it wasn't verbatim, and the word charter was not uttered during, his, uh, during any of his questions. So it makes you wonder, okay, well, what's he doing at this point? Uh, you know, the, the question of firearms, her potential involvement, uh, you know, this is emerging at this point, and he's giving this, like I say, a paraphrased version of the charter warning, but uh, not a clear one. And at one point, uh, soon thereafter, on page 97, line 3026, Miss Banfield asks, very reasonably, do I need a lawyer? Staff Sergeant Vardy, no. I'm saying to you that this is, these are your rights. Okay. So that's problematic in this way. Anything she said before that, uh, you know, really the entirety of the statement, because even the charter warning, such as it was, paraphrased, I don't think was clear enough, was direct enough to count in, uh, you know, if there was a charter challenge. If she was being charged with anything and these statements were being used in order to prosecute her, uh, I'm sure they would be thrown out, uh, disregarded as evidence. By the way, I'm sure James Lockyer, her Toronto-based uh, criminal defense lawyer, uh, known across the country, would have uh, picked up on this as well. So it makes you wonder a few things. One is, you know, if the she was charged, she was charged with uh, providing ammunition to Wartman, her common law spouse. Those charges were referred to restorative justice. Sometimes that's done if it's a minor charge. Sometimes if it's done, if the Crown feels they don't have the strongest of cases, which they wouldn't have here. Secondly, it would have been embarrassing for the RCMP if she was charged with something alleged to be involved, who helped him out, helped him with his planning, any of those things. And then all of a sudden you get back to these statements and they discover, hey, wait a second, nobody gave her a charter warning, nobody advised her of a right to counsel. All of that uh, could have been tossed out, would have been very embarrassing for the RCMP. So um, why not just accept her version then and avoid all of those embarrassments, accept her version at face value, refer to restorative justice, don't allow cross-examination in the Mass Casualty Commission proceedings. It's a neat little package. It avoids any embarrassment for the RCMP and just, you know, okay, this is the version we're going to accept. Now, that is not to say, of course, that her version lacks uh, credibility. It's, uh, you know, she gave four statements. Her statements were consistent, however much time. Anyway, so you have to give her credit for that. Uh, give her statements some credibility as a result of that consistency. However, she's never been cross-examined. Uh, we've never seen her speak. She's not spoken publicly about any of these things. So, you know, that's that's on the other side of the scale. So it would be interesting to see. the Another interesting thing, after he gave this sort of paraphrased uh, charter warning, then they were still talking about firearms and bringing them over the border, and Staff Sergeant Vardy basically tells her what to say about that. Uh, says, well, hang on now. Uh, if you knowingly transported uh, guns with your spouse, well, boy, you could be charged and you could be a whole lot of trouble. You didn't do that, did you? Uh, you didn't knowingly take them across the border, did you? Uh, so, of course, she answers, no, of course not. I, you know, overheard that they might have been here, they might have been there, you might have put them there, but uh, it wasn't quite clear to me and he wasn't talking to me and I don't know. So, uh, that protects her, and it was Staff Sergeant Vardy that basically told her how to protect herself against those kinds of questions. So really, uh, um, you know, something to think about there when we uh, listen to her testify, speak on Friday. Another thing that struck out to me, and uh, really, she didn't really spend much time talking about her time in the woods. I mean, she gave very long answers of other things that happened, of, you know, Lisa McCauley's dogs coming over to a party and uh, how upset she was about that and all these other things. But she talks about leaving the scene where she was in the back seat of the mock police vehicle, climbs through the window, goes out, uh, doesn't take a gun, leaves the building, goes hides in the woods. 
And then she's hearing uh, these, you know, loudspeaker, you know, bullhorn kind of voice. She thinks it could be a workman. She's not sure it could be police. She hides. And so then that's it. She describes then coming out, crawling out in the morning, going to uh, uh, Leon Joder's place and being rescued, uh, meeting the police. Well, there's about six hours missing there of time in the woods. Like I've, I've spent nights in the woods overnight by myself. And if you're awake, it's a long night. There's, uh, you know, there's noises in the woods. There's animals running by. There's all those things. I mean, she kind of alluded to some of that, but uh, there's, you know, there were other things going on. There were vehicles coming through. I mean, it seems if you're reading her statements, it sounds like she was describing maybe the first hour of that time, may or more or less, and then the last 15 minutes where she came out of the woods. That seven hours, six hours in the middle uh, doesn't uh, seem to get much attention. She doesn't describe falling asleep. She doesn't talk about any of those things. Uh, so there's um, some questions there that will have to be answered. Well, who knows whether they'll have to be answered, but they should be answered. They should be asked, at least. So that was, uh, those are some of the things that stuck out to me. Um, you know, the charter warning in particular, having that not been given, may have driven a lot of what the commission, what the RCMP have accepted about Miss Banfield's testimony because they don't want to be embarrassed as an organization or personally themselves. So, uh, but we'll wait. I mean, uh, her version may, may come out more credibly in person than we see, but without being cross-examination, uh, without being cross-examined, um, we can only take so much. Anybody can perform for a few hours, especially with lots of practice and uh, preparation help. All right, so there were actually, yes, the proceedings. I mentioned that earlier. The first one was from Tristan Bridges and Tara Lee Tabor, uh, who uh, wrote a paper on mass shootings and masculinity based out of the United States. Their research was based out of the United States. Not much to learn from them. Um, if you went on the street and asked 100 people, which gender do you think commits the most mass shootings? Uh, the it's close to 100 of those would say men, and they would be correct. Yes, it's always men. Uh, that's that's the way that is. Second one uh, was a foundational document on... Uh, by the way, why did they have to go to the University of uh, Southern California, Santa Clara, to get that information? I'm not sure. I'd uh, be curious to see how much they were paid for that report which was really just a reflection of their existing research. I've done some checking in on Professors Bridges and Tabor. Anyway, or Tober, sorry. Second one was a presentation on the family of origin violence, that is the Wartman family, uh, which uh, if you've read uh, Paul Palango's book or if you've read some of the uh, some other news reports, the Global News uh, podcast, 13 Hours, you would know all about the Wartman family, a uh, real disaster, uh, Gabriel Wartman's father, uh, Paul, was abusive. His father was abusive, both miserable, violent uh, abusers. Um, you know, uh, which is, of course, an explanation, uh, perhaps, of Gabriel Wartman's upbringing and behavior, but not an excuse. Uh, so that was uh, sort of that. Uh, the last part was, was kind of interesting. Dr. Deborah Doherty talking about gender-based violence, talking about her early work in Atlanta, Canada, and so the question was, so when was that? The early 1990s. Well, that shows you how recently some of this work has actually started, uh, which is not that long ago. She talked about the Death Review Committee, which uh, started in Ontario, is coming to Nova Scotia through Dr. Matthew Bowes in the medical examiner's office. Talked a lot about this in the Desmond Inquiry, that these, uh, you know, a, a death that happens uh, at the hands of another or self, uh, self-harm, there needs to be a review committee to study some of the risk factors that are associated with these deaths. Uh, so that'll be coming to Nova Scotia, uh, indeed, uh, through uh, the Desmond Inquirer recommendations, which we're expecting in a few months' time. She also talked about in rural context, um, an obvious point to anybody that lives in a rural area, area, why don't people call the police if you're in a city and you're the neighbor in your neighboring apartment, uh, you're hearing noises, it sounds like a fight, all that bad stuff. Yes, you'll call the police. I don't know those people. I'll call the police. If your neighbor in a rural area is, uh, you're hearing noises and all that trouble. 
people aren't as likely to call the police. Well, I know that person or something, right? I mean, that's uh, less likely to call the police on friends and neighbors. That's that seems to be life. So uh, those those are things to be overcome. Uh, she talked about ways to encourage uh, women to come forth and talk about what had happened to them and all those things. So some good uh, good material from Dr. Doherty. Um, earlier stuff was uh, was fairly obvious. The family of origin. If people hadn't read the news reports, uh, would encourage you to read those reports or just become familiar with it, just to see how it goes generation to generation. Uh, what I tell to you know clients, people in those situations. You know, get away from them. Get away from your family. Get away from your friends. Find new friends. Find new people. Get around better people. It's interesting because in this particular case, Wartman has a brother who was uh, given up for adoption down in the States. Turned out just fine. Uh, coming from the same situation, but got out of there, not through his own choice, but was adopted. So a real interesting case study in a way of uh, nature-nurture kinds of things. It's... Uh, uh, brother Jeff uh, down in the States uh, turned out just fine. Gabriel Wartman turned into what we know. So um, uh, so interesting contrast there. Anyway, those were some thoughts, uh, some reading over the weekend that I did from uh, Miss Banfield's statements and uh, listening to the material today. So I'll be watching uh, again the rest of the week. Tomorrow I'm in meetings all day, but I'll try to post either late tomorrow night or early Wednesday as I can. And I'll be watching then on uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday as well to uh, keep you up to date on what's happening. So until then, thanks again for watching. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time.